The American Iranian Council presents AIC Through the Ages. Please join me in welcoming Senator Biden. Thank you. Hassan, thank you very much. I, uh, I want you to know that uh, Hassan, I have taken advantage of his knowledge and taken advantage of his friendship to seek his advice on many, many issues, including Iran. As a matter of fact, had we, had I my way, he, uh, I would be referring to him as Ambassador Namazi, um, but uh, there's still time. Um, Mr. Ambassador, how are you? It's great to see you. See this fellow right here? Stand, stand up just like so everybody can see you. This guy here? Any mistake I make goes back to the time when he was tutoring me as a young 29-year-old senator, and he was at various stages of working for the committee and or running the intelligence uh, committee, which I was, quote, a charter member back in those days. And it's great to see you. It's great to see you. Let me uh, um, uh, say to Professor uh, Amir Ahmadi uh, how much I appreciate the invitation. I don't know where he is. Uh, there he is. I thought maybe he left. He's heard me once before, so he may have. Um, and uh, and I, I want our, our host to know that your invitation to spend the entire day uh, uh, here, I hope, is not dampened by my speech. I hope I do nothing to dissuade you from spending the entire day. It's an honor to be invited to be speak before such a distinguished group uh, uh, of, uh, of Americans. Uh, the number of accomplished individuals in this audience today is a testament to the absolutely extraordinary achievements of a thriving Iranian-American community. You have enriched the United States with your many talents and your cultural traditions have strengthened our diversity in a way that I think you don't fully appreciate. You also have a critical role to play in serving as a bridge between the United States and Iran. Today, I'd like to share with you my views on the United States policy toward Iran and the kind of relationship that I believe the United States and Iran should have. To save you the suspense, the short answer is a much better relationship than it currently enjoys. I say this for one simple reason. I believe that an improved relationship with Iran is in the naked self-interest of the United States, and I would presume to suggest Iran's interest as well. Iran sits in the geopolitical heart of a region that has long been important to our security concerns. On its eastern frontier sits the newly liberated Afghanistan, where the military mission is far, far from over. To the east is a nuclear-armed Pakistan that is, a, uh, uh, just a short while ago, stood on the precipice of a potentially devastating conflict with its arch-rival India. To the west is a recalcitrant Iraq, <clears throat> with a dangerous leader who Iranians grew to know all too well during a long and bloody Iran-Iraq war. And to the north are the undemocratic, potentially energy-rich states of Central Asia and the conflict-ridden Caucasus. And to the south are several American allies that sit atop the largest known oil reserves on the face of the earth. So it is not an understatement, in my view, to say that the direction Iran takes in the coming years will have a significant impact upon American strategic interest in the region. Clearly, we cannot speak of Iran's direction without addressing its internal political dynamics. Since President Khatami's election in 1997, Iran has been embroiled in a gradually escalating power struggle that the outside world has watched with considerable interest and sometimes with some bafflement. While elections haven't been perfect, the Iranian people have made clear in four separate ballots over four years that they are demanding fundamental change. The results of these elections have been the creation of a divided government, an elected branch consisting of a parliament and the presidency that, by definition, is more in touch with the will of the Iranian people. Juxtaposed to that is the appointed branch which holds many of the key levers of power, including the judiciary, security organizations, and other bodies populated by those whose vision largely revolves around the perpetuation of their own authority, in my view. It is this hardcore clique which refuses to give way to the will of the people. Over the past few years, they have been thwarted 
They have thwarted the goals of Iranian reformers. They've arrested journalists. They've imprisoned close allies of the president and often resorted to violence. They've harassed and prosecuted minorities in Iran, Jews and Baha'i. They, they direct policies that pose a threat to our interests as well, not the least of which is that, the Iranian, that Iran continues to support terrorism and the escalation of violence in the Middle East. Its recent involvement with the, uh, with the arms smuggling incident is a reminder of the policies that Iran must abandon if there is to be a true rapprochement. And many questions remain unanswered about the role played by some Iranians in the Kobar Towers attack that left 19 U.S. servicemen dead in Saudi Arabia. But shortly after September 11th, ordinary Iranians held a spontaneous candlelight vigil in Tehran in solidarity with the victims killed in the United States. Yet some of the Iranian leaders don't appear to understand how drastically the world has changed since September the 11th. Their continuing support for such groups as the Islamic Jihad put them on the wrong side of a new fault line, separating civilization and those who seek chaos. As you all know, Iran is continuing an aggressive drive to develop weapons of mass destruction and long-range missile systems. In these efforts, it receives considerable foreign assistance, especially from Russia. While support for terrorism appears to be directed by those in, hard, in the hardline branch of the government, the support for Iran's missile and nuclear weapons program seems more broadly based. The reason is a combination of three main factors, in my view. First, legitimate fears over Iraq and, to a lesser degree, Pakistan. Second, the belief that nuclear weapons will enhance Iran's stature. And finally, we cannot dismiss the fact that some elements within the government see a potential blackmail value in the acquisition of weapons of mass destruction and long-range missile capability. But whatever the motivation, the United States must place the highest priority on preventing Iran from gaining such dangers and stabilizing weapons. And I don't mean merely by the use of force. There are a number of options we have for doing so. We cannot simply dismiss Iran's security concerns, as some in this country are, re are very ready to do. They've been the victims of a chemical weapon attack by Iraq, but the neighborhood uh, has the potential to change for the better and maybe change their thinking. Already, the Taliban menace no longer threatens Iran. Next door, Pakistan's president is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, resigned to attempt to deal with re re religious extremism. And I believe that the U.S. will ultimately uh, have uh, to facilitate a regime change in Iraq. These three developments alone would drastically alter Iran's security environment for the better. No Taliban, a different Pakistan, and an Iraq without Saddam Hussein. We must also be willing to hold discussions with Iran to develop creative solutions, as we began to do with North Korea. And we must step up our efforts to end support by Russian entities for Iran's nuclear and missile efforts. In my view, this haven't, hasn't received nearly enough attention in the past few years. Clearly, although we must combat the spread of weapons of mass destruction to any country, the threat from Iran is not simply a function, a function of capability, but of intentions as well. If Iran evolves in a more democratic direction and the U.S.-Iranian relationship improves, then the threat it poses certainly is much reduced. This then raises the question of the ongoing power struggle underway within Iran. The United States is not in a position to have a major impact on this struggle, in my view. Nor should we intervene in any, nor, let me repeat this, nor should we intervene in any direct way. We should be mindful of the painful history of our two countries, which includes reported CIA support for a coup in 1953, and it still resonates with many Iranians, and it should counsel us to be extra cautious. Nonetheless, we should be clear about where we stand. We are squarely with the Iranian people in their desire for a democratic government and a democratic society, without a precondition or expectation that they will all of a sudden all become pro-American. Iran has a disproportionately young population. Half the people in Iran were born after the revolution. These young people and many of their parents and grandparents have grown wary 
I should say weary, probably weary as well, weary of Iran's isolation. They want Iran to take its rightful place in the international community and to embrace the rapidly changing world and bend it to their own needs. They want the same kind of social, political, and economic freedom that others enjoy. And they deserve to have these aspirations fulfilled. As I said, we should have a better relationship with Iran. Unfortunately, this is not solely for us to decide. We can obviously make things worse, but we cannot determine the outcome merely by attempting to make things better. Ultimately, that must be decided by Iran. And it is unlikely to come about absent a change in the attitude or composition of the present Iranian regime. While the Bush administration continues the policy of its predecessors by seeking dialogue with Iran, some in Tehran have a very different view. Part of the government clearly wants to talk to us and has talked to us over Afghanistan, for example. But hardliners regard this as a useful boogeyman to continue to stir up passions of their most zealot and ardent stalwarts. So the question is, what can we do from the outside? to help the Iranian people realize their aspirations. In my judgment, we must direct our policies in a way that they do not rest upon the principle of reciprocity. That they do not rest upon the principle of reciprocity. In other words, we should assume that the continuing power struggle will prevent Iran from responding to any particular American gesture and take steps that are carefully calibrated with the aim of assisting those who seek change within Iran. Now, how do we do that? A difficult feat. First, I think we must recognize that the most entrenched elements in Iran seek to perpetuate Iran's isolation through confrontation with the outside world. Those who seek change want to increase Iran's international linkages. So let me outline five specific steps I think the United States can and should take. First, I'd urge the Bush administration to issue a general license to permit American non-governmental organizations to financially support a broad range of civil society, cultural and human rights, and democracy building activities in Iran. Such funding is currently banned by an executive order. It's unfortunate that our own government, not hardliners in the capital of Iran, that have prevented practitioners of democracy in America from aiding their struggling counterparts in Iran. Secondly, we should continue to work with Iran on matters of mutual interest, as we did in Afghanistan. It is true that some hardline elements in Iran are clearly interested in stirring up trouble in Afghanistan, which I recently visited and spent some time. But the story that many do not know is that Iran and the United States coordinated their efforts on Afghanistan very closely over the past several months. And I would say to you, when I was in Kabul, there were representatives of the elected government in Iran who were there with me at the time I was meeting with Mr. Karzai, offering genuine help and assistance, who I believe genuinely would like to see a government established in Kabul without their direct influence and direct direction. The dialogue of Afghanistan should serve as a model. The dialogue between the United States and Iran on Afghanistan, in my view, should serve as a model and should be extended to other areas of mutual interest, like the future of Iraq, another topic of discussion and cooperation. Third, the United States should acquiesce to Iran's bid to begin accession talks to the World Trade Organization. The process of accession will take several years, but Iran would have to make structural changes that would increase transparency and undermine the key power bases of hardliners if, in fact, they were to gain accession to the World Trade Organization. I find it somewhat interesting that the very people in this administration and in the Congress who would strongly oppose my saying that are the very people who talked about the need for accession talks and the admission of China into the World Trade Organization, which I strongly support as well. Fourth, we should be willing to indirectly assist Iran on refugee and narcotics matters. 
Iran has a huge population of Afghan and Iraqi refugees. American non-governmental organizations that assist refugees are willing to help and should be supported in their efforts by our government to help Iran with its problem. Likewise, Iran has paid a heavy price in blood and treasure in battling narcotics traffickers on its eastern frontier. Iran has asked the international community for help, <clears throat> and it makes sense, in my view, to assist them through the United States, uh, excuse me, for the United States to assist them through the United Nations, another means of some transparency. And fifth, we should continue to encourage citizen exchanges. A two-track circuit has developed in recent years, and it's important to keep it going. Organizations such as the American Iranian Council, the Open Society Institute, the Nixon Center, they've all played a critical role, and I applaud them all. I also applaud the President of the United States for his view that there should be direct dialogue with Iran. Notwithstanding the fact of his State of the Union speech, he nonetheless have indicated he believes there should be direct dialogue. In that regard, let me also extend an invitation. In my capacity as Chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, I'm prepared to receive members of the Iranian Parliament whenever its members would like to visit. If Iranian parliamentarians believe that's too sensitive, I'm prepared to meet them elsewhere and anywhere if they genuinely wish to engage in discussion. Without speaking for my colleagues, I'm confident many of them would join me in such a historic meeting. Indeed, some, including my friend Senator Arlen Specter, did participate in an earlier brief encounter at the Metropolitan Museum of, Ar Museum of Art, organized by the American Iranian Council. We should be under no illusions that these steps by themselves will have a decisive impact. The direction that Iran takes and the form of government it chooses are ultimately matters for the Iranian people to settle. But I do believe, I do believe that our actions have reciprocal actions that occur in Iran. And I would respectfully suggest that at least the five points I have made would be of some positive impact in moving those forces in Iran with whom we wish to see succeed, have a greater opportunity to succeed. As you know, um, Nowruz marks the start of spring. So let's hope that in this session of re this season of renewal, that Iranians and Americans can find a way to build on shared interest and work constructively to overcome their differences peacefully. I pledge to do my part, and I know that all of you will continue to lend your energy to this critical effort. And let me end as an Irishman with a quote from an Irish poet. My staff kids me and says that I think the only poets in the world are Irish. It's not that, they're just the best. <laughs> and one who recently received the Nobel uh, uh, Prize for Literature in I believe 95 or 96, is a fellow named Seamus Haney. And he wrote a poem called The Cure in Troy. It was about his Ireland, and it was a takeoff on Sophocles. But nonetheless, I think it applies here. There is one stanza from that poem that I wish for us all, and I believe may be at hand if we act appropriately. He says, history teaches us not to hope on this side of the grave. But then, once in a lifetime, that longed-for tidal wave of justice rises up, and hope and history rhyme. I truly believe we have a chance, a chance, to make hope and history rhyme. I truly believe that catastrophic international events that so transgressed the bounds of humanity like what happened on September 11th. Give nations, as such tragedies give individuals, an opportunity to change direction without losing face. I'm sure those of you of Persian descent don't have the problem we Irish occasionally have. Occasionally you'll find Irish brothers or sisters who will not speak to one another for years over some perceived slight 
It occasionally happens. Now, I'm sure that doesn't happen with any person. But, and I mean this sincerely, think about it. The only thing that usually brings families back together like that is some tragedy. Dad, mom, di mom dies, dad dies. Brothers or sisters show up for the wake. And they use that occasion to pretend as if nothing ever had happened. So neither have to change. Neither have to admit they're wrong. And they can both focus on the one thing they have in common, the loss of dad. I truly believe that September 11th threw a new fault line in the world. It was that there are those who support international terrorism and chaos, and they are juxtaposed against nation states. Every major world leader with whom I've met since that time, and in my capacity as chairman, I've had the privilege to meet many. Every one could picture that second jetliner going into the 84th, 82nd story of a high rise in Shanghai, or into the Eiffel Tower, or into the, uh, uh, the Colosseum in Rome. Everyone understood immediately what was at stake. I think that's why the Iranians immediately offered to deal with extracting down pilots in Afghanistan. I don't think we should be naive, but I think we should take advantage of openings that hold at least a slight promise, a slight promise of a change in the relationship. You all serve this nation well by attempting to educate us as well as your brothers and sisters in Iran as to what's at stake and what is possible. I thank you for it, and I particularly thank Hassan, who has been a good friend and a good advisor for my, uh, my uh, in effect, on-the-job training. But I want you to know, my first administrative assistant was a guy named Faraboris Fatimi whose uncle was the foreign minister who was assassinated with Mossadegh's regime coming down. So I've begun to go to school on Iranian matters, or as he would always say, Persian matters, long before this occasion. I hope the day comes again in my tenure as chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee that we have a balanced relationship with a great and powerful and cultured nation that has the opportunity to contribute in ways it has not been able to for a long time. I thank you all, and I thank you, Hassan, for the opportunity. Thank you. Um, Senator Biden has time for maybe one or two questions. He has to return to the floor uh, to vote, uh, so we can entertain one or two questions. I'll let you recognize whomever, <laughs> so you get in trouble. Okay. Gentleman in the back. Yeah, uh, my name is Hassan Masali. I belong to Iranian Democratic Forces, the opposition against this current regime in Iran. My question is, uh, there are any initiative from you and U.S. administration that uh, to have a dialogue with the Iranian democratic forces, as I, I mean the opposition, in future? The answer is there have been some dialogue already. I cannot speak for the administration. Do I have the question, by the way? Um, I cannot speak for the administration, and I certainly won't deign to speak for the Congress. No one can do that. Um, but uh, um, at this moment, um, I know of no formal um, invitation uh, from either body to speak with, quote, the opposition. I assume you mean um, expatriates that are here in the States or other places, as opposed to those within Iran who are seeking democratic change as well. So I know of no such uh, meetings that have, been, have, have, have taken place or have been proposed. Um, gentlemen in the back, Mr. Uh, Harandi from Scarsdale, New York. I congratulate you uh, by electronics when I heard the message, the, the news you coming today here. 
and I want to uh, congratulate you also uh, for your courage to be here. And uh, my question is uh, to you, uh, sir, uh, any consideration to release uh, those assets? It's been 23 years, long enough to just have a good gesture and have dialogue with Iran. As you well know, there was genuine consideration in the last administration of doing that, which I was deeply involved in. Our ambassador could speak to it better than I can. Uh, we ended up running into a few roadblocks uh, in that effort. Uh, I'm assuming and taking the president as word that he is prepared to sit down and discuss and open a dialogue with Iran on any issue. And so I am assuming, without being able to speak for the president, that part of that discussion, part of that discussion would relate to the assets. And I'm assuming that if there was good faith that was extended to have legitimate discussions and legitimate um, opportunities to see some change in attitude, that there'd be something to, able to be done. The ambassador, as I said in private, will be able to tell you uh, afterwards uh, um, how hard we worked to try to get that done in the last administration. But the idea that at this moment there will be a unilateral action on the part of the United States to, uh, to deal with that issue, I would not think is likely to happen. It will relate to the willingness of there to be a dialogue having the Iranian government or any government representatives step forward and say, we're willing to engage in discussions with you. Uh, and uh, I thank you all. I apologize. There's a very important vote on so-called cafe standards. And although my, uh, my constituency is interested and concerned about Iran, uh, they are very interested in knowing whether or not the General Motors and Chrysler plants in Delaware are going to remain open. So I thank you all very much. The American-Iranian Council has been promoting dialogue and understanding between the U.S. and Iran since 1990. For more, visit us-iran.org.